Let's uh, we'll continue our study on the doctrine of the church. Uh, tonight we begin looking at the local church. Uh, we'll start with a word of prayer and then we'll get into the study. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can spend together. We thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, teaching us uh, from it. And we thank you for giving us all that uh, we need uh, for life and godliness in your word. And we just pray that as we uh, look into uh, what you have to say about uh, the purpose of the church, that we might uh, follow that purpose uh, here at East Wing Baptist Church, that you might uh, be magnified and glorified in all that we do. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so as we study the local church, um, we do look to the early church. Now we know that uh, in Acts, uh, the church in, it was in its infancy. Uh, it was new. Everything was kind of new. And if you've heard it once, you've probably heard it a hundred times, that the book of Acts is a, is a transition book, a book of transitions from one dispensation uh, to another. It's in the early stages, the beginning stages of the church. So the Holy Spirit has just come uh, to indwell believers, something that had not happened uh, in the Old Testament. You have sign gifts uh, available at that time to validate uh, this new movement to uh, to show that the message and the messenger uh, the messengers were from God. You have believers at this time gathering in houses. Um, you don't have the office of deacon until Acts uh, chapter six. So there are some growing pains, I guess, if you will, uh, some practical solutions. Uh, but by the time we see the Pauline epistles come along, there's a lot more. Order. Uh, we see the sign gifts have all but vanished. Uh, we see them mentioned in 1 Corinthians, but uh, they're not mentioned in 2 Corinthians. Uh, and, and though believers met uh, in homes uh, for practical purposes, this doesn't mean that we are bound to meet uh, in homes. Uh, there's no instruction regarding what our buildings, uh, what buildings are appropriate to uh, to meet in. Uh, aside from these transitionary. Uh, details and descriptions that I've mentioned, I would say that we should follow the patterns and principles that are laid out for us in the scriptures. Um, otherwise, why would God include them, right? Um, and so there are those out there that uh, would say, okay, a lot of cultural influences went into the start of the church, so therefore we don't have to listen to those things. We can kind of adapt the church to our culture. And probably to some degree, we tend to do that. But I think overall, we want to stick to the scriptures. We want to stick to what God says, because God assures us that he's given us everything that we need uh, for life and godliness in this book. And of course, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 uh, is our foundation, right? Uh, that's the foundation for all of our theology and, and for everything that we believe as believers. It tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And I believe this definitely uh, applies to how we operate as a church as well. And so uh, when we look to what the purpose of the church is, how the church ought to be run, we go to the scriptures, how firm a foundation that we have. Uh, God has given us everything that we need uh, in his word. Paul writes, and we looked at this verse uh, last week uh, in 1 Timothy, uh, you can turn there, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verses 14 and 15. Uh, Paul, uh, of course, writing to Timothy, uh, writing to Timothy uh, to explain to him how church should be done, uh, how he should conduct uh, the church uh, in Ephesus. And he says, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the ch church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. He says, I'm writing this to you in case I don't get there, but I want you to know how the church should operate, how, how it should conduct himself, itself. Uh, and so uh, we have what we need right here in this book. Uh, to know how the church should behave, how, how we are to conduct church, how we are to do church. Remember we looked at last week how many people have different definitions of, of what church is. Well, we don't get to define that. We don't get to come up with um, me being on the beach some Sundays, I'm doing church there this week. No, God gets to decide how we do church because he is the author of it. He's the head of it. He's the creator of it. He's the one who will build it. And he's the one who gives us the instructions on how things ought to go. Now, to be sure, not every church will look the same. Um, there is some flexibility, right? Uh, I would say the New Testament gives us the essentials of a local church. And there's a certain amount of freedom in how uh, that specific local church will conduct itself. 
conduct itself. For example, there's no set number of hymns that we're to sing on a given Sunday. Uh, right? One church may sing uh, six or seven. One church might sing two or three. Uh, there's no specific number of deacons or, or pastors uh, for a specific church. All we have is that we ought to have deacons and a pastor. Right? Uh, there's organization there. How many of each, it doesn't say. Um, we're not given instruction on how often uh, we're, we're to have commun- communion. Just that we should do it regularly and we should do it until Jesus Christ come ba- comes back. So one church might have six pastors and 11 deacons and do a communion every Sunday, while another church may have one pastor, two deacons, and have communion once a quarter, right? So there's differences, there's some flexibility, but ultimately the principles are laid out for us in the New Testament. We have the essentials that show us how church should be run and show us what a church actually is. Uh, and we looked at that definition uh, by Floyd Barackman last week, and we'll get back to it uh, not next week, because next week is uh, the cantata, but the week after. But uh, because the New Testament gives us what we need, we can actually study the doctrine of the church. And so tonight I want to begin uh, by looking at the purpose of the church. Uh, and then uh, next time we'll get into membership uh, and church officers and, and polity, probably not all in one week, because that could take a little bit of time. But tonight we want to look at the purpose. Why is the church here? Uh, And again, we go back to the New Testament. We go back to the Bible to determine why the church exists and its ultimate purpose. We don't get to come up with uh, that on our own. Uh, God has defined it for us uh, neatly in the scriptures. And uh, the ultimate purpose of the church, what is it? You guys probably know this. The ultimate purpose of, of everything, right? There's the hint. Uh, it's to glorify God, right? First Corinthians ten thirty one. Whether you therefore you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And really, this is the the ultimate purpose of man. This is the ultimate purpose of of everything in life, of of the scriptures, uh, of everything. Is to glorify God. Is to make much of Him, to value Him, and honor Him, right? And, and we mentioned this in our study in Philippians that uh, ultimately glorifying God is to make, bring Him close. And it's to show uh, the world what God is like. Uh, we are to honor Him and celebrate Him for who He is. In 1 Corinthians uh, 6, uh, verses 19 and 20, uh, it says we've been purchased by the blood of Christ, basically. And so we belong to Him. And so He says there to honor and glorify the Lord with our bodies, to, to make much of Him. Uh, and that's the number one priority of our lives. And of course, then it makes sense that it's the number one priority of the church. And that kind of goes without saying. Colossians 1.18 tells us he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And of course, the church, Christ has the preeminence. God has the preeminence. So everything that is done as a church, and this is why we want to make sure that this is first, falls under that umbrella, falls under the goal of making much of our God, making much of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, to, to make sure that uh, he is magnified. And so we ask ourselves, with whatever we do, uh, as individuals and as a church, are, is this, am I making much of Jesus Christ? Is this ministry glorifying God? Is it magnifying his name? Is it, is it showing how supreme and, and wonderful and, and magnificent that he is? Is it showing the world that he is worthy of our worship? Uh, because church is ultimately about God, I think. We all understand that, uh, but that's what the Bible teaches us. And one of the ways, of course, we make much of God uh, and we value Him is worship. Uh, and, of course, every act as a believer is to be an act of worship. First um, Peter 2, First uh, Peter 2, uh, verse. you can turn over there because I have a couple of verses here. First uh, Peter 2, 5, <clears throat> I'll give you a chance to turn there. I get carried away and talk fast and... By the time you get there, I'll be on to something else. I'll slow down. Um, <clears throat> First Peter two five. It says, "Ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ." And then in verse nine, he he says that we're a chosen generation, uh, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, so that we would show forth the praises of Him who hath called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And so what we're, we're seeing here is that a worship uh, is 
not an outward, mindless ritual, right? True worship comes from the heart as it responds to God's truth, uh, as it responds to God's word. It's not empty ritualism, right? As some denominations, cults, if you will, uh, would say. It's not just repeating something for the sake of, uh, of repeating it. It's not empty sentimentalism. It's a heartfelt response to who God is as revealed in his word. Jesus says to, that we're to worship God in spirit and in truth. Right? There, is some, uh, there is some emotion there in response to the truth. That's how we worship God. It's not just empty emotions. It's, it's, it's emotions based on the truth of God's word. Right? And so we worship and we glorify our God, our God through uh, singing songs. That's what we do uh, uh, in the morning service and, and Sunday nights. We sing songs. And hopefully we're singing those songs uh, out of hearts that really mean uh, the words that we're saying. I know it's easy to just kind of, uh, you know, just read the words and, and sing them. But hopefully uh, we mean what we sing, right? And that's worship. Uh, we worship God through, through that. We worship God uh, through, through giving, uh, through offering. Uh, we worship God through uh, the observances of the ordinances, of, of the Lord's table, communion, and baptism. We'll look at those uh, in more specifics uh, as we get through our study here. But we glorify and we exalt God as we uh, do everything, as we conduct everything in the church, including, including business meetings. Right? Those are for God's glory. Everything is to be done for His glory. Uh, and that's purpose number one. Right? Nothing else matters uh, beyond that. And so we carry out that purpose by doing the other two purposes. And number one is edification. Right? The other two purposes are edification and evangelism. Those are the two main purposes be under the umbrella of glorifying or exalting our God. Uh, and so the church gathers for edification, this is how you typically think about it, and scatters for evangelism. So we come together as believers to build each other up, right? to mature in the Word of God. Uh, and then, as we mature and as we're built up, as we're encouraged, we go out to evangelize. This doesn't mean that we don't preach the gospel in our services. It doesn't mean that we don't welcome the unsaved people in when they come. And I would encourage you to invite people. Uh, to come in. And, and I'll say it here, that if I see uh, an unfamiliar face, I'm going to make sure that I preach the gospel that Sunday. And if I don't, then you have permission to come to me afterwards and say, hey, there was somebody here and, and you didn't preach the gospel. And then I will feel awful, but I will appreciate uh, the heads up and I'll make sure that it, it doesn't happen again. So, so I would encourage you, yes, absolutely invite people here. And if I see uh, that somebody is here that I don't recognize, I'm going to make sure the gospel goes out. Uh, that's always been kind of my, my thing, but I don't know if I've verbalized it, and I want to make sure that you know that. So, yes, by all means, encourage folks to come here. Uh, invite them. But, uh, <clears throat> again, typically, we gather to grow. We gather to edify, and we go out to preach the gospel. And, again, it doesn't mean that we don't have evangelistic-type events uh, or programs, because we definitely do that, and I'm in favor of those things. And I think uh, you know the, the Grand Prix uh, last week was was wonderful. Uh, we want to continue to do that type of thing, uh, but ultimately the church is made up of of believers, uh, and, and so the church ultimately gathers to grow. Right? I know of one church uh, in North Carolina where the pastor says that if you're there to grow, you're in the wrong place. Well, that's not. That's not, that's not the church. Uh, the church is made up of believers to grow. Uh, yes, I appreciate the, the evangelistic mindset, but the church is ultimately uh, to feed the flock. In Acts chapter 20, uh, verses 28 through 32, uh, we alluded to this this morning, a couple of these verses. Uh, Paul, um, writing to the, uh, the Ephesian elders, he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves. And to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God. That was the responsibility he put on them, to feed the, the church of God, uh, to, to fill them up, to give them what they need so that they can grow. And, and then he warns that because there are wolves, there are those out there who desire to, uh, to, to destroy you and divide you, and you need to know the truth. So, so preach the truth, to, and he's telling the pastors, preach the truth to them. Preach the Word of God. At my uh, installation service, Pastor Rowe um, charged me to preach the Word of God. To preach the Word of God because that's, you know, that's the main task 
uh, of the church is to get the word of God. And in 2 Timothy, you can't help but read through the pastoral epistles and see this over and over. Uh, to preach the word of God. Why? So that we can be built up. So that we can grow. So that we can be edified. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter, um, let's see, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Uh, we just read verses uh, 16 and 17 of chapter 3. And it gives us the character of the word and how it is used to mature us. That is profitable. Uh, and then in chapter 4 after that, uh, right, the word of God is, is, the, is the thing that's going to mature us. It's going to make us grow. Uh, and so then he says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. So he says, preach that word so that people can become, the church can become spiritually mature. That's how we glorify God as a church. We grow, we grow in him. That was Paul's desire in Colossians. Uh, I make it my goal to warn and teach every man that I may present them mature in Jesus Christ. It's the essential function of the church. And so the church needs to be built up and it needs to be growing with the scripture. Um, and so that's how we know what God is really like, right? As, as, as we look into the scripture so we can worship him as he truly is. Uh, it's an indispensable ministry of the church. And again, uh, 1 Timothy 4.13, he says, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. So we teach others so that they can teach. And that's how the ministry goes. That's how we build each other up. And of course, Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12, uh, a familiar passage uh, to many of you. Uh, that the pastors uh, were given in order to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. So you get the idea. The ministry of the word is essential to the edification of the church, which is a main purpose of the church. But we also build up one another. We edify one another as we use our gifts and our abilities to serve one another. We have the ministry of one another. It's not just, it's not just the pastor who, who does the building up. We each get to build each other up in the church. In Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, another familiar passage to you. It says, And let us consider one another, uh, and to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much, more, so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so, gathering together with each other in true fellowship is meant to build one another up and to help us grow. But the key there is you have to be here. Uh, you can't neglect the gathering. Uh, and honestly, uh, uh, for me, uh, your presence here is an encouragement to me. Uh, when you're here, that is an encouragement. And I know it is for other folks as well. When you're here, it encourages us. That's an encouragement, just, just your mere presence uh, being here. But also, uh, not only that, as we gather, we provoke one another to love and to good works. We help each other grow. Uh, that's how we edify. That's one of the purposes of the church, to edify one another. And that's done uh, through the preaching and teaching of the word, but it's also th done through uh, our being together, our fellowshipping together. Uh, again, uh, the pastors are given to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, for, for edification, for encouragement, for helping us to grow. And so the idea of the New Testament is that everyone would be involved in what we might call encouragement ministries. We're all here to encourage one another uh, in the faith. Uh, that's the genius of the New Testament, of God's design. Then instead of, instead of having very few people burdened with ministry, you have everybody who's given the blessing of ministry. That's the design. And that's, and that's a wonderful thing that uh, you come in, you get equipped uh, to, to, to minister and to encourage one another uh, in the church and outside the church, at home, at work, in the community, serving each other throughout the week. Uh, that's edification. That's building up. Um, and, and we all have that privilege. We all have that uh, responsibility of, uh, uh, of making a phone call, right? Or, or, uh, or making a visit. And you know what? And, I, and here's a confession. Confession time for me. Uh, I missed out on this uh, for a long, long time because I never really went out 
uh, to visit the folks in this church. And so I never really got to know some people on the level that I know them now. And, and, and so I'm going to share it with you now. Don't miss out. Um, you know, just this last year and a half or so, just getting out there and visiting has been a wonderful blessing for me, selfishly. Uh, no, but it's been a blessing for me to, uh, to get to know people on a, on a deeper level than I've been able to before. And I'm still working my way through it. Uh, but, you know, for many years, you know, I just kind of did, you know, did my own thing and uh, kind of, uh, you know, maybe I felt like, and this is not that I wouldn't be welcome, but, you know, you just kind of get on in your own little tunnel vision and, and you don't do those things. And then uh, Valerie and I have had this conversation a few times and it's like, you know what, we missed out. We missed out on knowing some uh, wonderful people all these years. I mean, we've known you, you know what I mean? But uh, maybe I'm just rambling, but uh, it's a confession, so I'm allowed to, I guess, right? Uh, but I've had, you know, so many wonderful conversations and you just get to know. And so I would say, you know, you can visit people too. You can give people phone calls too. Uh, because it is an, it's an incredible blessing. It really is. And uh, I wouldn't want you to miss out on, on that. Uh, so I'm going to share with you from my mistakes. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's a wonderful thing. And, and uh, we can all be involved in that. And that's the idea. You get to be involved in it. It's not like a, it's not a burden. It's a, it's a blessing. And it really is. And so uh, I would encourage you, uh, you know, to make time for that. Because, you know, we can get so busy. But, you know, the people here are so important. And they're so uh, wonderful. And, and you really get to know them. And so um, I'll move on now. But, you know, you, you can do that as well. And so and the Bible says... You know, comfort yourselves together, edify one another. Uh, and so the work of the ministry is up to every one of us. You know, it's all, it's all up, it's up to each one of us to build each other up, to encourage each other. Uh, and First Peter, we looked at this verse, we all have different gifts. We all have different abilities. We all have different strengths uh, that God has given us. Uh, and he wants those gifts uh, to be used to glorify him. Uh, and it says in 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11, as each has received the gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. And that doesn't always mean just inside this building. Like I said, it means, you know, in people's homes, as you can. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. One writer wrote, and I don't remember where I picked it up, uh, but he says, the pastor doesn't possess all the gifts necessary for the p proper and complete building up of the body. Uh, his gifts are equipping gifts, whereas other, whereas other members of the body have useful gifts for a well-rounded ministry to the whole body. It is foolish for a church to think that one person can do all the ministry, as it is equally foolish for the pastor to see himself as the only one capable of serving the saints. His job is to equip, theirs is to minister to one another, and the end result is an edified church. Each one has different abilities that, that God can use to encourage one another. That's the, that's the beauty of the local church. And so the bottom line is that uh, the church uh, has the priority of glorifying God, and one of the ways we glorify God is through the edification ministry. That is through the equipping ministry of the Word of God, but it's also through the encouraging ministry of one another, using our gifts, using our abilities, using our presence uh, to encourage each other, to build each other up. Uh, we see in Scripture over 40 different one another commands that we're all to be uh, practicing in order to benefit and edify the church that God may be able to be glorified. We're to love one another, admonish one another, care for one another, serve one another, bear the burdens of one another, be patient with one another, forgive uh, one another, speak the truth. I'm not going to read all 40. Uh, speak the truth to one another, like it seems like it. Be kind to one another, provoke one another to do good, and so forth. Um, and again, um, we're a team. Uh, we mentioned that this morning as well. Uh, and we pray for one another. I don't remember if I mentioned that one, but uh, we pray for one another as well. And that's an incredible blessing that we have as well. And, uh, one of the marks of the, the early church is they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayers. Uh, prayer for one another. It's, it's an essential ministry of the church, and we are to use it to build each other up, to help us to grow uh, together as well. Um, and so we exalt our God, we exalt our Savior, we edify the saints, 
Uh, and then we evangelize the lost. We evangelize uh, sinners. Uh, one writer said, without an appropriate emphasis on outreach, the church can become too inwardly focused and disconnected from the societies in which God has placed those members. While there is a clear priority of believers doing good to one another first, before reaching outside the church, there is a definite responsibility to reach out. Believers cannot cloister or, or hide themselves or, or isolate themselves uh, from the world if they expect to fulfill the functions of the church. Outreach is vital. I think we uh, understand that. Um, we have uh, the adult uh, Sunday school class right now is focused on uh, evangelism because, of course, we have the Great Commission. Anybody quote that? And you want to, uh, Nate, I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> on the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. No, it's, it's, yeah. Right. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And so, as we are going, right, as we live our lives, as we're doing our thing on the day-to-day, -day, uh, wherever God has placed us, we are to preach the gospel. Right? In Mark 16, 16, 15, if I can get it out, uh, go ye to all the world and preach the gospel. Uh, and so, we take the initiative in evangelism. Right? Uh, assumes that we as believers in these verses are out there and we're going to minister and go and to share the gospel with the purpose of making disciples of Jesus Christ. Evangelism uh, is seen in the Bible as about reaching out to unbelievers, taking that initiative, engaging with the lost. Uh, another writer says, the greatest single reason why the church is declining is that it has ceased to go out to the lost. For some reason, evangelism has become something to do in church. Again, not saying we can't do it. Within the walls of the church building, the church today expects unbelievers to come to it. When the fact, that, when the, in fact, the church should go to them, and and we've talked about this many times that unbelievers today are not flocking uh, inside church buildings, um, and, and so we have to maybe be uncomfortable and go to them. Oftentimes, uh, again, that doesn't mean we can't have uh, you know evangelism things going on in our church, and we can't invite them, because absolutely we can and we should. But we also must make sure that we are going out, uh, that we are sharing the gospel. And again, a plug for the Sunday school class, uh, we're going to get to, uh, you know, how to become more comfortable uh, sharing our faith, so that we can go uh, out uh, to them. Someone pointed out that cults, not saying we should be like cults, I'll get that out of the way right, right now. That cults don't establish evangelistic centers. They get together to train and equip their people to do the work of their ministry. Uh, the people are totally indoctrinated, yes, in their, in their facilities. They, he, this person said that the average Jehovah's Witness, for example, is always ready to give an answer to everyone for why they believe what they believe. The average Bible believer is often ignorant of God's truth. The author goes on to say that the devil knows which system works. The cults do not lack for converts. Right? And so I think there's some truth to that. Because they don't expect unbelievers to go to them, for the most part. Uh, they go to the unbelievers, sometimes too often. right? Um, but this is God's design for the church. It's how evangelism, evangelism is supposed to be done. We are to go out to them. And I think that's implied in Romans chapter 10, uh, verses 13 through 15. Um, a familiar passage as well. It says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Uh, and the idea is that we are the ones to go out and preach the good news. The responsibility is ours to make sure that we are faithfully preaching that gospel. Um, and Jesus, in uh, John 20, 21, Jesus said unto them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Specifically the disciples, but he sends us. Right? It's, a, it's kind of a, a missionary heart that we go out and we preach the gospel. Um, and again, doesn't mean we can't have Awana. It doesn't mean we can't have VBS. I'm all for those things. Closing programs. Anytime we can share the gospel, we want to. Um, 
you know, special events, those things are wonderful and great, and we should do that, and God has saved people through those things, so I would never want to stop doing those things. But our primary focus uh, and goal in the issue of evangelism has to be that we as individuals, as we are out among the lost, we have to share our lives and we have to share our Lord with these people. Uh, John MacArthur writes, the most effective evangelism done is done on a personal level in the area where you live. Uh, again, um, that's the way the New Testament uh, describe, describes it. He says, uh, this is more effective. Uh, he says, which is more effective, a week of revival meetings once a year or a congregation evangelizing 365 days a year? Well, the gospel, if it's being preached uh, by a church every day of the year, then... You know, that's, that's the ultimate aim, right? That's, that's what we want uh, to do. And, and, and we want to share the gospel with the ultimate aim of, uh, of making disciples, right? And we've been given uh, the necessary power in the gospel. There is power in the gospel, uh, and there's power in the Holy Spirit in Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you will be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Uh, and Jesus, in the Great Commission, says, Lo, I will be with you always. I'm going to be with you. I'm not going to leave you alone. Uh, I'm going to be with you as you preach the gospel. And so we can be bold in our witness because we know that Christ is with us, that Christ has given us the Holy Spirit to indwell us, to give us that power, that we can be the witnesses that God wants us to be. And so we carry that commission through the power of the Spirit as we share the gospel right here in Livington and right here in the surrounding communities that, that God has uh, placed us in. Uh, and then we also, as part of the church, we look to the rest of the world through our missionary program, which uh, I would say is uh, an incredible uh, ministry of this church. Uh, the way we support mis- missionaries and, and the amount of missionaries uh, that we support. And I've had conversations with people uh, that have visited and, and seen how many missionaries that we support for being a small church, and, and they're amazed. Uh, And I think that's just a wonderful testimony uh, of our heart for missions. Uh, And and that is definitely part of the outreach um, ministry of our church, of evangelism. And, uh, and, you know, I commend this church and have been impressed with what this church has been able to do uh, with the missionaries. Uh, And and then that's part of the outreach strategy uh, of a local church that we see in Acts, of being a witness in your local uh, town, but also throughout the world. And, And I See, that is a, a, great, um, a great ministry uh, of this church. Uh, but missions is also a vital part of the local church ministry, and it's a part of the purpose of evangelism. And so the third major purpose of the church, then, of course, is to share the gospel with the world. And so the primary purposes are to exalt our Savior, uh, edify the saints, and evangelize uh, sinners. And I'm going to close with something I found on the internet, which not everything is good, but uh, this happened to be okay. Uh, It says, there are many obstacles and distractions that would keep the church from focusing on its primary goals and the functions that lead to fulfilling that goal. A local church's health with respect to that goal cannot be measured in financial numbers or attendance. Obviously, financial stagnancy and low attendance can be symptomatic of an unhealthy church, but they are certainly not the telltale signs. In fact, looking to numbers as the primary sign of success is one of the most common distractions the church faces. Rather than repeating the mistakes of using faulty measurement tools, let's focus on the biblical standards revealed for the church. When assessing the health of a local church, let's ask the right questions. Are we teaching the word of God effectively so that people are maturing? Are we walking more closely with the Lord? Are we able to teach others? Uh, When we gather together, uh, are we effective at encouraging one another? Are we looking toward each other's growth? Uh, our, our, our worship songs, edifying each other, are they appropriately thanking and praising God? Does our outreach reflect biblical priorities of outreach? And if we can answer yes to those questions, then we are heading down the right path of a healthy church. Uh, if we're failing in those areas, then we have to you know, change how things uh, are being done. But once again, we must depend on the wisdom of God's design as he builds his church, not us. Right? It's our place to focus on us being faithful to what he's called us to do as a church, not on the outcomes, because we can't, as much as we would like, we can't make people uh, come to Christ. We can't make you know, those things happen. It has to be God that, that builds it. And it will get built. Um, 
You know, and our labor will not be in vain if we are faithful in trying to accomplish uh, His purposes. Um, and He's doing it in His timetable, which, you know, oftentimes uh, in our impatient society, we probably want things to happen uh, maybe more quickly than, than, than God will, will let them happen. So um, if we're, as long as we are uh, focusing on and doing exactly what God wants us to do by uh, glorifying Him, by growing and maturing in our faith and faithfully preaching the gospel, then you know, we can rest in the fact that we are doing our part and we can rely on God uh, to do His part as well. Let's close with a word of prayer.